Hello hockey fans and welcome back to another video. For the last decade, the National Hockey League has played a number of its fixtures in a variety of unique venues across the sporting world. Whether they've hosted a regular season game in Europe as part of their global series, played an outdoor classic in an NFL or MLB stadium, or hosted a preseason game on a makeshift ice surface in a Las Vegas parking lot, the league has used some pretty unconventional locations in seasons past. Though these gimmick games have become a regular fixture in the NHL schedule, and though the frequency that they are played has become a polarising topic amongst fans, the number of teams that have taken part across the league, and the variety of venues that have been used throughout the world, have meant that for the most part, these matchups have become a welcome addition to the sport. However, the NHL's first fixture away from home ice saw the best team in hockey play against some of the most hardened criminals in the country. So in today's video, let's explore the time when the Detroit Red Wings played in a prison. Now in order to explain how this fascinating showdown came about, allow me to take you all the way back to June of 1953, when the Detroit Red Wings, who had been crowned regular season champions in each of the last five years, and had lifted two Stanley Cup championships in their last three seasons, embarked on a series of promotional visits across the state of Michigan as part of their sponsorship with Stroh's Brewery. While much of the tour saw members of the organization travel Michigan's lower peninsula, Red Wings captain Ted Lindsay and general manager Jack Adams found themselves on a barnstorming trip in the state's upper peninsula instead. Having started in St. Ignacio and having later moved through the Sioux, the pair eventually found themselves making a stop at Marquette State Prison, a maximum security facility that housed some of the most violent criminals that the country had to offer, and a building that had garnered the nickname the Alcatraz of the North. Despite the obvious risks that came with visiting such a dangerous place, Lindsay recalled that the prison wasn't as bad as it had been made out to be. That said, he did check with the guards about his personal safety during his initial visit, to which he was told that, quote, if anybody thought of doing anything, they would be dead before he took two steps. Doesn't prison sound lovely? After taking a tour of the facility, and after putting on a short presentation in the prison's auditorium, Marquette's warden, Emery Jacques, asked Adams if he would be interested in bringing his entire Red Wings team to the prison to play an exhibition game against the inmates of the facility. With Lindsay recalling that Adams, quote, almost swallowed his tongue as he didn't know what the heck to say in response, after viewing more of the facility, and after talking back and forth with Emery, Adams eventually accepted the invitation, stating that if the warden could construct an appropriate playing surface, and find a way to pay for the team's plane travel, hotel rooms, and meals for the duration of their trip, he would take him up on his offer. Though Adams never expected to hear from Jacques ever again in a million years, or for his sizable requests to be met, the Red Wings GM was shocked to discover that the warden had called his bluff. Having found the means to fulfil his end of the bargain, and having begun construction on a hockey rink that was set to be ready in early 1954, Jacques extended a formal invitation to Adams and the Red Wings just a few months after his initial visit. Despite the criticism he might face for sticking to his word, Adams honoured the agreement and accepted the invitation, so plans were made for the Red Wings to travel to Marquette during a break in their schedule later that season, and play an exhibition game against the prison inmates. So after visiting the facility during a promotional tour that summer, thanks to some persistence from the warden and the prison moving quickly to meet his requests, Jack Adams had just agreed for the Detroit Red Wings to play a hockey game against a group of convicted felons in a maximum security prison. Gah, the 50s really was a different time, eh, folks? Though the upcoming contest appeared to be nothing more than a unique exhibition game on the surface, some claim that there may have been some ulterior motives for this showdown. In fact, rumours have suggested that Adams also agreed to play the game at Marquette as a favour to Harry Keewall and Ray Bernstein, a pair of the prison's inmates who were part of the notorious criminal mob The Purple Gang. Not only does this rumour suggest that the Red Wings GM had some kind of acquaintance with an organised criminal ring, it also infers that Adams had direct ties to the Mafia. However, there are conflicting reports as to whether these rumours are indeed fact or fiction, so take these claims with a pinch of salt. 
But I digress. As the 53-54 NHL season began, and the Detroit Red Wings looked to reclaim their title as playoff champions, Marquette Prison got to work on building both an ice rink and a hockey team that was worthy of their highly esteemed guests. With the bulk of the work being passed on to the prison's new director of physical activity, Leonard Oki Brum, the former University of Michigan hockey player, who had already built a hockey rink at his previous job at the University of Alaska, was tasked with constructing an adequate playing surface for the upcoming match. Having previously built a miniature golf course, a shuffleboard court, and a curling rink at the prison, constructing a hockey rink worthy of their NHL foes seemed to be a task that was right up Brum's alley. However, the former hockey player had to do so without any of his materials being used by Marquette's inmates as tools to escape the facility. In his book recounting his time at the prison, perfectly titled, We Only Played Home Games, Brum wrote that, quote, The inmates and I all saw this as a future hockey rink, while most of the custodial staff considered this serious escape equipment, at least until it was nailed down. Despite the obvious obstacles that he faced, after several months of construction, Brum had finished building the rink and was ready for his NHL visitors to arrive. In fact, the athletic director had found a way to go above and beyond his original task, as he had used his knowledge of construction, as well as a plethora of materials donated by his building contractor father, to create a full regulation-sized hockey rink, complete with wooden boards too. Not bad for a guy working with limited time and resources while convicts were trying to steal his supplies, eh, folks? Speaking of convicts, since Marquette State Prison was designed for older prisoners aged 28 and above, most of the inmates who tried out for the new hockey team were in their 30s and 40s. Unfortunately for Brum, very few of these tryouts could skate well, and even less of them showed a minimal ability in the sport. If that wasn't bad enough, Brum didn't even have the equipment that he needed, and he had to fight just to get hockey sticks for his players, since sticks were disallowed at the prison due to the possibility of them being used against other inmates or guards. Having finally gotten the go-ahead on the sticks, and with Jack Adams donating the rest of the player equipment from his folding Omaha Lancers farm team, Brum began to relentlessly drill his ragtag squad of inmates in the weeks and months before game day. Wearing green jerseys with Emery's boys written on the front, since Adams had jokingly sewn it onto each of their garments in honour of the facility's warden, the prison team, which became known as the Marquette Prison Pirates, took part in several exhibition games against teams from the outside world before their match against Detroit. In fact, the Pirates ended up playing quite well during these contests, which made them feel pretty confident for their upcoming challenge against their NHL opponents. Though they would end up being well and truly embarrassed by their professional counterparts, their showdown against Detroit would become an event that no one in Marquette would soon forget. On February 2nd, 1954, the Detroit Red Wings travelled to Marquette State Prison to play an exhibition game against the Pirates. Though this fixture was anything but normal, given the razor-wire-topped stone walls and the armed watchtowers that surrounded them, this match not only became Detroit's first official contest on an outdoor rink, it was the first outdoor game played by an NHL team in league history. Despite the obvious reasons for Red Wings players to feel a little on edge, given that they were about to play against murderers, arsonists, and bank robbers in a facility full of convicted felons, the shouts of encouragement and recognition from the roughly 600 convicts in attendance would soon put all of their fears to rest, as Detroit left winger Johnny Wilson recalled that many of them were great hockey fans who knew all the boys and were cheering us on since they listened to all the games on the radio. Despite some Red Wings players being a little apprehensive at first, Ted Lindsay wasn't worried in the slightest, since he figured that he could take care of himself, and that he felt very strongly from having been close to them in the summertime and mingling with them that there was no reason to be worried. In fact, Lindsay wasn't the least bit concerned that they had just put hockey sticks in the hands of some of the worst criminals in the country, as he joked that, quote, I was viewed as a hero because I was leading the league in penalties, so I fit right in with the boys. As the Red Wings took to the ice on the recently completed rink, the entire inmate population, except for those in solitary confinement, turned out to see a star-studded Detroit lineup lace up their skates in the maximum security facility. 
With Detroit's roster that day, including a plethora of future Hall of Famers, including Ted Lindsay, Terry Sawchuk, Red Kelly, Alex Delvecchio, and future all-time leading scorer Gordie Howe, Red Wings coach Tommy Ivan put his team through a series of big league drills and a skills competition before the game to entertain the crowd. During this time, Howe noted that both the conditions and the playing surface were nothing short of perfect, as the 21 degree overcast and windless weather made the ice, quote, the best he had ever played on. Lindsay also agreed with these sentiments, saying that, quote, any time you get nature doing the freezing, you've got the best ice possible. As the inmates watched the Red Wings warm up, Lindsay noted that many of the spectators were curious as to what they were seeing. As they had heard us on the radio and seen us on the television, now they were looking at the real person. Once the various drills were over, the puck was dropped and the game between pros and cons finally got underway. With the Pirates roster being made up of convicts who typically spent 23 hours a day behind bars, including a habitual thief netminder who had just been released from solitary specifically for the game, as well as members of the custodial staff whose hockey skills weren't that much better than their incarcerated teammates, save for director of athletics and rink architect Oki Brum, the visiting Red Wings would quickly run rings around the hometown team. With Detroit taking a 10 to nothing lead after the first 10 minutes of play, and with the Pirates barely being able to touch the puck during that span, Red Wings goaltender Terry Sawchuk would find himself sitting on top of his net for much of the first period. In fact, the netminder deliberately tripped one of the Pirates players so that he could take a penalty and leave the ice to sign autographs midway through the first. Yet the Pirates still couldn't capitalize on the empty net and break the shutout. That said, nothing summarizes the Pirates' frustration more than when Brum said, quote, The only time I touched the puck was when I pulled it out of the back of the net. With the Red Wings leading 18 to nothing after the first period, and since the visiting team could have easily reached 50 goals if the game kept going with its current format, in an attempt to make the contest more interesting, the two teams swapped some of their players for the second period. For example, Terry Sawchuk was recruited to play goal for the Pirates. Red Wings teammates Alex Delvecchio and Sid Abel were also added to Marquette's lineup, while Lindsay and Howe would be joined on Detroit's top scoring line by an inmate playing center. That is, until Howe shifted sides and spent the second half of the game wearing the Pirates number 16. However, this setup would only last for the following 20 minutes of play. Frustrated that they had been blown out so badly by their pro counterparts, and exhausted from having to keep up with the greatest team in hockey at the time, the Pirates surrendered the ice to the Red Wings for the final period of play, who then decided to run an intra-squad scrimmage for their inmate audience. Despite the notable star talent on display that day, no Red Wings player seemed to earn the inmates' respect quite like Detroit defenseman Bob Goldham, who received many whistles in admiration for repeatedly dropping to the ice and sacrificing his body in order to block a shot. Once the final buzzer sounded and the period-long scrimmage had concluded, the Red Wings were crowned the obvious winners of the exhibition game. Though the final score was unknown due to the change in format midway through, Marquette's warden presented Jack Adams with the Donica Trophy, which was made from a galvanized honey bucket that the inmates typically used as a toilet. Not only that, each member of the team was also given a personalized handmade leather wallet from the prison craft store, which were individually personalized with their names and included the famous Winged Wheel team logo. Not a bad reward for decimating a group of murderers and dangerous convicts, if you ask me. Not only was the On Ice product a thing to behold, some of the stories that came out from the game take the craziness level to even greater heights. For example, Red Wings forward Marty Pavlich supposedly discovered that his childhood mailman had become one of the inmates at the prison, while Howe supposedly claimed that Marquette's goaltender threatened to kill one of his defensemen after he laughed at the netminder for letting in a goal. Given the kind of people involved and the venue that they were in, a threat like that might have actually carried some weight once the contest was over. Though the game could have easily ended under much more dire circumstances given who and where they had played, Ted Lindsay recalled that he didn't remember the final score and said it was insignificant in the grand scheme of things. 
Instead, he stated that the match was an experience that I thoroughly enjoyed, felt that his opponents were all perfect gentlemen, and said that, quote, the emotions that you have at the time are what you should be able to feel. The emotions of what you felt with them, and the emotions that you felt for them, and how you felt being on the ice with them, all of that other stuff you forget. I guess it doesn't matter whether you're facing off against NHL superstars or convicted felons. Once the puck drops, it's all about what happens on the ice. Once the post-game celebrations had concluded, the Red Wings stuck around the prison for a few more hours to eat dinner with their exhausted opponents before Gordie Howe, the Warden and Jack Adams led a talk for the inmates. From there, the team left the prison behind and headed into the city in order to play an exhibition game against a local semi-pro team in Marquette. During their latter game against the Marquette Sentinels, the team that had sponsored the Red Wings trip and had paid $1,800 for their charter flight to the city, Detroit defenseman Jim Red Eye Hay was confused to see Oki Brum taking a regular shift for their second opponent that day, as he had clearly mistaken the blue liner as an inmate at the prison. To be fair, the Pirates all wore the same green jersey, so it was probably pretty hard to tell who was who, you know. With the prison game having been nothing short of an astounding success, there was hope that Detroit might return to Marquette in the near future and play another game against the Pirates in the seasons that followed. However, this wasn't meant to be, as the Red Wings never visited the facility again, both in the several years that followed and in the decades since their initial showdown. That said, it wasn't for lack of trying. According to Brum, Marquette tried to set up a rematch with Detroit, but both sides got busy doing their own thing, and the two parties never really sat down to iron out the details. When recounting the events, Brum wished that somebody had gone to Detroit and met with Jack Adams, as there could have been the chance to try it all again, or even make it a yearly tradition if they played their cards right. But ultimately, this didn't happen. That said, Brum insisted that the contest was the damnedest hockey game that was ever played, and given that he spent several years running athletic programs for convicted murderers, I'll take his word for it, you know. After their eventful day in Marquette had finally come to an end, the Detroit Red Wings departed from the city and continued on with their 53-54 season, leaving much of their hockey equipment behind for the Marquette Prison Pirates to use. Having embarked on their trip to the prison as the best team in the NHL, thanks to their 28-12-9 record in 49 games, the Red Wings would pick up right where they left off to finish the year, as they posted a 9-7-5 record in their final 21 games to clinch their sixth consecutive finish as the NHL's regular season champions. From there, Detroit would embark on a deep postseason run and make it all the way to the finals, where they defeated the second seed Montreal Canadiens in seven games to clinch the 1954 Stanley Cup. If finishing the year as both the regular season and the playoff champions wasn't impressive enough though, Detroit would do it all again the following year as they defeated the Habs in seven games during the 1955 finals to lift their second consecutive Stanley Cup and their fourth championship in the last six seasons. Maybe playing against prisoners and toughening themselves up against convicts worked out pretty well for them after all. Though the prison game has become an obscure side note in Detroit's championship winning season, and though the hometown cons were no match for the visiting pros, that typical winter's day in February of 1954 ended up being host to one of the most unique games in NHL history. Sure, it was certainly risky to have a pro hockey team play a bunch of maximum security prisoners, and the league definitely wouldn't sign off on this idea in today's NHL, but if this exhibition game isn't a prime example of how sports can bring people together regardless of their background or social status, I don't know what is. After all, it turns some of the most hardened criminals into curious, wide-eyed fans. There aren't many things that have that kind of power, you know. Whether it was a good idea or not, here's hoping that Hollywood has been paying attention, because this could make a really good movie someday.
And that was a look at when the Detroit Red Wings played in a prison. What do you guys think about this game? Do you think that the league should try something just as unconventional in the near future? Or do you think that this game was very much a product of its time? Let me know in the comments below. I would love to hear what you guys think. But thank you very much for watching, guys. I hope you have enjoyed. Please feel free to like, subscribe, share, or watch some of my other videos. Thank you very much for watching, and goodbye. A big thank you to Drew Fawcett, Houston NG, and Worthless Pieces for helping support this video via Patreon. If you too want to help support the channel a little bit further and get a shout out at the end of every future video, make sure you head over to patreon.com/oddmanrush and become a patron today.